I am absolutely thrilled to announce the Icarus Fringe and Film Festival coming up June 8th to the 11th at the William Carlos Williams Center in Rutherford, New Jersey. This will be a four-day immense festival featuring the stars of the dissident left and right, including Max Blumenthal, Aaron Maté, Nick Gillespie, Michael Tracy, Jeffrey Schollenberger, Sam Husseini, Jeffrey Tucker, Gene Epstein, Jeremy Kaufman, and Ben Burgess. To get your tickets to the Icarus Festival, go to IcarusFest.com, and I'll see you there. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. This past week at Unregistered Academy, we began teaching a course on the history of the relationship between the United States and Ukraine, which began shortly after World War II when the CIA began to finance and support a group of Ukrainian nationalists who had collaborated with Nazi Germany during the war. That relationship between the CIA and this group of Ukrainian Nazi collaborators continued through the Cold War and up to the present time. It produced the official ideology of the Ukrainian government, which led to the current war with Russia. In this course at the Academy with students, I conducted an interview with Professor Per Rudling of Lund University in Sweden, whose research on this topic lays clear this history, but which has not yet been published. We chose to share this interview with the public because of its obvious importance to the world. This is my interview with Per Rudling. I am joined from Lund, Sweden, by Professor Per Rudling, who um, is doing work on the history of Ukrainian nationalism that is, I think... <laughs> Um, I can't wait for this to be published because I think regardless of what side you're on in this issue about the Ukraine war, I, I think your work is as important as it gets because it gets to it, the roots, I think, of the war, at least some of the roots, some of the origins of it. Um, and I think it helps explain at least one side's motivations. Um, but it it's it's the, and it's the kind of work that I just don't see. So I have invited um Three, the three scholars I'm aware of who have done work on this issue, the history of Ukrainian nationalism, and in particular, the relationship with the United States um, between nationalists in Ukraine and, and the CIA and other agencies. Um, so yesterday we had Norman Goda here, um, who actually, he's the one who told me about your work, and that's how I found you. And I was really glad he did, because as soon as I found what you've been up to, I realized this is absolutely essential for understanding what's happening here. Um, so he he walked us through the history, just specifically, of the relationship between U.S. intelligence agencies and Ukrainian nationalists, in particular the OUN, um, Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, and their, their descendants, so Nikola Lebed and Bandera, somewhat in a more minor role in that, but very long history began in the late, really at 40, 1945 and continued um, through 1990, 
and much was done under uh, Operation or Project Aerodynamic, Operation Aerodynamic, in which there was uh, massive amounts of national Ukrainian nationalist propaganda um, sort of flooded into Ukraine through that period, through the Cold War. And one of the things Norman and I struggled with, and he didn't really know the answer, and this is kind of, to me, maybe the crux of it, is to what extent... Um, and I'm not sure if this is my first question for you, but I certainly this will be the bigger the bigger overarching question. To what extent is there a connection between that that history history of Ukrainian nationalists um, through the Cold War and the current war, the current sort of political forces who are important in Ukrainian politics and have been for the last ten years? How much, for instance, did that propaganda that was um, aided by the CIA through the Cold War coming into Ukraine with nationalist ideas, how much did that inform people now who are in some way or another determining or influencing Ukrainian policy? Um, so that's kind of, you know, if it's irrelevant, it's irrelevant. If there is no connection between that history um, and the current forces, then that's the end of the discussion. But it seems to me unlikely that there is no connection. And your your work, as, I, as I've seen it, um, suggests strongly that there might be. So um, why don't we why don't we begin? You can you can start by answering that right now, or we could just begin with the chronology and, and talk about the background, um, the history of Ukrainian nationalists. And and then we can talk about their relationship with the United States, maybe. Well, this is a very large question. I, I'll, yeah. I'll try to answer it, you know, to give you an introduction to sort of, you know, this, this topic here. Mm -hmm. The paradox is, of course, that Lebed led one of the splinter groups of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, the smallest one, the Un Zagordone or Un Z. Mm. Or, well, these groups had this, have those very long, awkward uh, uh, acronyms. He mm -hmm. led a group no, known as ZP. UHVR, Sakardone Predstavnist Ukrainsko i Helovne Visvolne Rade, the Foreign Representation of Ukrainian Supreme Liberation Council. Six, six letters, very, very complex. Anyway, and this was essentially the front, the front organization funded under the Air Dynamics Project, later on the PD Dynamics and QR uh, Dynamics Project. This was the revisionist UUN which in 1943, I don't know how much Norm told you about this, but in 1943, uh, after Stalingrad in August of 1943, the UUN got together and essentially decided, I think, and I argue, I think um, this argument is the correct one, they did this as a front, as a, as a turnaround in the face of the, the Allies. They had oriented themselves towards Hitler and Mussolini. They had, in mm. 1941, adopted a, a program which was explicitly totalitarian, anti-Semitic, uh, they you know, introduced the raised arm Roman salute, uh, and, and, and so on and so on, right? Then in 1943, it was clear that the Axis uh, camp would collapse. They were not intended to collab to be collaborators. They wanted to have an independent Ukraine, right? Um, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, so, uh, of course, um, in 1943, 39, the Slovak, uh, the Slovak far right had obtained their state. And in, in April 1941, the Ustash in Croatia had obtained their state. So the idea was if you orient yourself towards Nazi Germany, they would reward you. You declared even in the declaration of statehood in 1941, they declared it would work closely with Nazi Germany and, and Adolf Hitler, who's building a new order in Ukraine. Then in 43, this was collapsing. Hitler was not interested in giving the Ukrainians independence. And now when the Axis powers were collapsing, they now started to cater to the West. And then they dropped the totalitarianism and anti-Semitism and all that sort of stuff and declared that they're now part of the Western or towards the Western world. Oh. Bandera was in Sachsenhausen. He was he was sidelined at this point. When he came out in 1944, he resumed his collaboration with Nazi Germany, paradoxically, whereas the OUN uh, the, the, um, continued to to orient themselves, at least on paper, towards the towards the Western Allies. It didn't huh. stop them from continuing and escalating the ethnic violence against Poles. They kept merging Poles in large numbers and killing Jews after August of 1943. But this group that declared that we were going to orient yourself, uh, orient themselves towards the West, they were the sort of the, the embryonic beginning of the group around Leben, the, the, the revisionist one, right? 
which mm -hmm. were democratic on paper, but in reality, it was small, elitist, almost landist organization, which did not allow anybody in to the group. Uh, and it was a small group of a few hundred people, uh, essentially, hmm. funded by the CIA, right? So that's how this one worked out, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the Lebed insisted on, on more pluralism and were indeed more open to pluralism compared to Bandera, who came out, as I said, mm -hmm. from Saxon House in 1944, who was openly totalitarian and refused to change the 1941 line. So the U.S. Uh, were not interested in fascism, of course, but uh, there was a strategic interest here that they were they were stimulating uh, Ukrainian nationalism in Ukraine as a tool to weaken a geopolitical adversary. So they sponsored Labour's group paradoxically because they did not support the breakup of the Soviet Union. They supported they never recognized the Molotov Ribbentrop Treaty, so they supported independence for Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, but they never wanted to break up the Soviet Union. They had recognized in 1934. The, the, the Soviet Union and Ukrainian SSR, right? Mm. So paradoxically, they stimulated Ukrainian nationalism without supporting Ukrainian separatism. And Lebed's group mm. here worked to disseminate this propaganda. Uh, they they had so-called Tam Vudav or Tam Is That, that is the publication abroad that is smuggled back to Ukraine. They worked with Radio, Radio Liberation of Bolshevism, which was the original name for Radio Liberty, Radio Free Europe, right? It was a it was a CA project up until 1971. They printed Lilliput editions of, of nationalist literature, which is sent by hot mm. air balloons and then what helium balloons and whatnot, mailings and whatnot. So the interesting thing here, the paradox is that whereas the Bandera movement was totalitarian, authoritarian, and published very sort of like dogmatic anti-communist uh, literature, uh, uh, continuing cult of, of, of personality around the leading band right leadership, Lebed's group was open to more pluralism they published dissidents religious dissidents they published even revisionist you know communists you know orthodox marxist leninists hmm. who criticized the soviet union for violating leninist policies they allowed for um, hmm. human rights discourses and whatnot so they this group under Lebed was themselves a closed conspiratorial anything but democratic group which stimulated pluralism as a platform for hmm. ukrainian dissent Hmm. And the U.S. government sponsored this to weaken the Soviet Union. But as a result of this, a number of really interesting, uh, stimulating, very sophisticated Ukrainian publishers found the platform and had these messages exported back into the, the Ukrainian SSR. So the U.S., by, by doing so, supported pluralism and supported, in a way, a democratic discourse. The problem was, of course, that Mikola Levin himself was the acting leader of the UN at the time of the massacres of the Poles. He was arguably one of the most high-ranking war criminals ever entering the United States. He was, was a convicted murderer, right? Mm -hmm. So he was himself an ethnic cleanser or even a genocidaire, if you go by the Polish government's uh, uh, line, because Poland has recognized what he did as a genocide against Poles, right? That's, of course, debatable, but that's, that's the Polish line. So the paradox was this highly conspiratorial, violent, totalitarian, ex-totalitarian, promoted pluralism. <laughs> The problem was, of course, that the issue of the Volinian massacres, the Ukrainian nationalist violence, the mass murders of up to 100,000 Poles in Galicia and Volinia in 1943-44 became a blind spot. It was not, of course, discussed in these circles. Neither was the Holocaust. Neither was Ukrainian involvement, Ukrainian nationalist militia, massacres of Jews in 1941. Uh, on top of that, the CIA also sponsored uh, the group uh, under Jerzy um, uh, Gedroitz, uh, the, the so-called Institut Literatsky, the literary institute in Poland, in, 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 uh, sorry, in, in, in Paris. Mm -hmm. Polish emigres that worked with the Ukrainians. There was a logic here, I don't know what Norm told you about this, but it was a, a, a logic to this, that uh, the Polish emigres was also dominated by right-wingers, but these were revisionist right-wingers. Well, the, the Polish or the emigre oh. government wanted to restore the borders of 1937, Poland, oh. right? Which included half of Ukraine uh -huh. and a lot of, you know. So these people said, okay, you have to give up this. You can't get Lviv, you can't get Ternopil, you can't get Vilnius back. They are lost forever. But instead, we will build an alliance. We, we, we will work with the Ukrainian nationalists. We will work with Lithuanian nationalists. Let them have, you know, just like the Germans will have to realize that Königsberg and Breslau is gone, we will have to release and give up our eastern territories 
And of course, by doing so, we will have we are working for an independent Lithuanian, independent Belarus, independent uh, Ukraine that would be democratic and anti-Russian. That was the idea, right? Mm -hmm. The price for this collaboration, however, was that Lebed ran this and he worked with the Poles and also the Polish elite emigres that worked with Ukrainian right-wingers could not discuss certain issues. So there was a taboo on, not only on the Holocaust, of course, but also the Volinian massacres. It came, it became in the, as a Polish historian, Bogomiła, Berdukhovska has termed this a conspiracy of silence. There were certain issues mm. that were not touched upon. The Holocaust, Polish-Ukrainian violence. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, the sort of the narrative which was produced by the emigre circles, not least by labor circle, were re-exported into the Soviet Union. Lenin, the Soviet past was obsolete and new textbooks had to be written. Hmm. Now in Canada, which had introduced official multiculturalism in 1971, this was, you know, it's a, every society, as long as we eat bananas or Red Luther or, or, or drinking coffee, you know, we, we've been multicultural, but normative multicultures in the sense that we are sponsoring various communities, right. uh, no, you know, that became Canadian policy in 1971. And in particular, this benefited the very large Ukrainian diaspora. So in Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian diaspora in Canada produced their own textbooks, Saturday schools, curriculum and whatnot. And they were able to just send them back to, to the Soviet Union after the collapse uh, to, to, to Ukraine mm. as floppy disks or PDFs or whatnot. So they had complete, uh, complete, complete, complete narrations of history. So the emigre narration of history, which had little room for the Holocaust and whatnot, returned to Ukraine at a time that Ukraine became independent, democratic and started seeking a path to Europe at the same time as in the European Union, the Holocaust became key to European memory or European social oh. culture. And it was necessary at least to pay lip service to the idea of the of the Holocaust, right? Because the Holocaust did not take place necessarily in, in Ireland or in, 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 in Spain. It took place, of course, in Ukraine and Poland. So, so there was this paradox that a, a, a memory full of blind spots on the Holocaust was re-exported to Ukraine and the awareness of the Holocaust, awareness of these issues was necessary for Ukraine to become part of the sort of European family of nations, so to say. So the paradox is that the, the Leibniz group was, was marginal. They never they had zero influence on, on politics in Ukraine. The band rights, the Bandera, that is the largest far-right group, they re-exported, they re-established themselves in Ukraine in 1993, but their influence in electoral politics has been minuscule. There had been a, there's been a number of members of parliament, but the UN never got more than regional successes in, in Western Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So politically, th there is a far right in Ukraine, uh, the Svoboda party, the right sector mm -hmm. and whatnot, mm -hmm. but they are much weaker than the far right in Hungary or in or in Poland, right? They, mm -hmm. they, they are not represented in parliament now. They got 10% at, at the highest uh, support rate in 2012, mm -hmm. I believe. But so the, the far right is there, but it's not politically relevant. But in terms of memory, in terms of memory production, there there is a disproportionate influence of, of right wing, uh, far right uh, nationalist historiography. And as uh, what's his name, Stephen Bannon talked about, right, that, that mm -hmm. politics is downstream from culture. There mm -hmm. is this idea that this was Ukrainian Institute of National Memory established in 2006, led by people from the Bandera movement that are erecting monuments to Bandera and Stetsko and, 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 and a number of these people uh, renaming streets, uh, shaping the sc school curriculum. So the paradox is that Ukraine is a liberal, democratic, European oriented, pro Western state, but has chosen or chose under Yushchenko, who was president in 2005, 2010, and under Parashenko, the previous president, to mm -hmm. push this narrative, right? The idea was to give Putin the, the middle finger, right? We're gonna, mm -hmm. we're gonna move away from the Soviet discourse as much as we can. We're gonna break with everything Soviet, and we're gonna restore a new Ukrainian historiography. The problem was, of course, that the UN did not kill many Russians. They killed primarily Poles mm -hmm. and Jews. And that meant that it poisoned, to some extent, the relations with Poland and Israel. So it's, it's, it's a vicious circle in that sense. That was a very long answer to a short question, but it's sort of like, it should give an idea about the far right politically, rather marginal, socially, in terms of the humanities and the history production, quite substantial. And that's a paradox here. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. That, okay. That's amazing. That's a lot there. Um, I am reeling from that. I knew some of that from listening to you speak before. Um, so let's, let's, 
go back to the war, the origins, um, and you've described Lebed as a totalitarian. And I'm, I've always been curious about this, by the way, you know, the, they've been called fascists. I mean, the na ultra, ultra nationalists in Ukraine, of course, have been called fascists every day since the war started. And I actually have seen, I've seen some evidence of it, you know, wearing a swastika, you know, on your uniform is pretty solid evidence. But actually, in terms of ideology, I haven't seen much beyond sort of an anti-Russian, I would call it racism, you know, calling Russians orcs and calling for their death and, you know, um, but that's it. I mean, so there's, I see the sort of anti-Russian stuff and I see, I see nationalism, of course, you know, the, the discourse about sovereignty, you know, Ukrainian sovereignty, right. Um, but that doesn't equal totalitarian that equals perhaps, um, genocidal racism, you know, which is obviously what Bandera and Lebed were practicing. But beyond that, I actually don't know about their ideology. What, how else were they totalitarian? Well, one problem here is that all those terms, uh, particularly these days, but they were always difficult in Ukraine mm -hmm. and even worse in the Ukrainian diaspora. How do you label these people? Because mm -hmm. fascism is clearly today not only a neutral way of assessing political movement, it's a term of abuse to right. call people fascists. That's, of course, and, and calling people Nazis. We've seen Russia use that as a cost mm -hmm. belly for them to justify their aggression. And there's mm -hmm. a great inflation in calling people fascists and Nazis. And I think that's that's, that's very destructive. Mm -hmm. So I use the term fascist, you know, I, I think it belongs to a certain, certain setting, right? Fascist was a European phenomenon and even, you know, extra European phenomenon, but you're, today is uh, something nobody wants to be associated with, but it was a new dynamic, powerful force in interwar Europe in virtually all of the post Habsburg realm, including Halicina, Galicia and, and, and Volhynia, which, which was not post Habsburg, but post Russian empire. Hmm. So the own the organization hmm. of Ukrainian nationalists, they did not call themselves fascists. They called themselves nationalists, Ukrainian nationalists with a capital N, right? which mm. complicates things because nationalism is not a right-wing ideology. It's not a left-wing ideology, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like the desire to set up a political community based upon a certain, like, you know, parameter. Mm -hmm. It can be left-wing, it can be, you know, you can have Ho Chi Minh and you can have Adolf Hitler and you can have whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So they want to have an independent Ukraine and they were stung and burnt by the, the, the tragedy as you saw it in 1918, 1919. The empires collapsed and here are states that never were, you know, never even were thought of before. No, nobody even articulated an agenda for an independent Czech Republic or 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 or, or Latvia or, or whatnot, right? And suddenly you have the states appearing, but the single largest ethnic group in Central Europe, the Ukrainians, remain stateless. And not only did they remain stateless, they were divided up before four between four states. In the Ukrainian SSR, they had certain cultural autonomy and significant support from the Soviet government for to cultivate the culture and language and literature in the 1920s before Stalin. And they had a very large number of them were in Poland, then they were in Romania and, and Czechoslovakia. And all of these states were authoritarian or later on totalitarian, if, if you want to use that term, that's, I guess, also debatable. So they were, the one was a revolutionary national, nationalist movement. They were mm -hmm. disgusted and, and dis, um, disenchanted with the mostly liberal or social federalist Ukrainian nationalists that were trying to set up state to the 1918 the people of the Ukrainian People's Republic, the UNR of 1918, their idea was to set up a democratic Ukraine in an alliance, a federal alliance with a democratic Russia. But of course, Russia became Bolshevik and that was not possible. So uh, the UN took up weapons, a little bit similar to the IRA perhaps, or, or other far-right mm -hmm. uh, uh, militants. They were waging war on the Polish state. They were trying to, UN was based upon a number of groups that were number of student fraternities, war veterans from World War One, and even groups that were openly fascists, like the Union of Ukrainian Fascists, which was a smaller group which came to join the UN. And they used violence. They attacked Polish government officials. They murdered them and hoping that the Polish government would crack down on Ukrainian nationalists and, and stir up more resentment. And the, the prize catch, the biggest success was the murder of the assassination of uh, Bronislaw Piratsky, the number two figure in the Polish government. But they killed about 65 people in the interim period. So they were using terrorists. They were openly and explicitly anti-democratic. They wanted what they call monopartinist, monopartiness of one-party states. Hmm. Their project for, for Ukrainian state was to be authoritarian, totalitarian. Uh, 
all the power was vested into the hand of one figure, the leader, the, the Vorst, which is the Ukrainian version of Kaudi or, or, or Duce or, or Führer, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the Führer princip principle, the cult of the leader, uh, uh, the right way, the right, raised arm salute, uh, anti-Semitism, and of course, the, the, the self-evidently clear orientation after 1933 on Nazi Germany, on the revisionist powers, because in order to bring about an independent Ukraine, you have not only to understand destroy Poland, but four states, right? So just like Poland, like a miracle almost, like became independent in 1918 as a result of three empires collapsing, right? The mm -hmm. Romanov Russian Empire, the Hohenzollern Empire, Imperial Germany, and the Habsburg Empire. Three empires collapsed at the same time, so Poland was resurrected. And Ukraine would demand nothing else, destruction of four states. So the idea to do this was to kick over the entire like chessboard, right? And who would want to do this? Adolf Hitler and Mussolini. The entire Versailles Treaty had to go. So they oriented themselves towards Nazi Germany. But they had also an, 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 an homegrown native anti-Semitism, totalitarianism on their own. So I would, you know, it's, it's almost contentious. Ukrainian historians get up, often very upset when they use the term fascist for the own because they see them as a national liberation movement. They prefer national liberators mm -hmm. uh, or, 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 or some other terms, right? Yeah. Uh, and I guess they were national liberators. They wanted to stay, stay yeah. liberated, but sure. they wanted to also liberated of Poles, of Jews, mm -hmm. of Russians, mm -hmm. and of liberal Ukrainians. They also killed a number of Ukrainians that did not support the idea oh. of a totalitarian state. Just like the Ustasha was a Croatian liberation movement, oh. if you want, right? Or, or, or what's it called, the Proud Boys. You might want to call them a liberation movement too. It's a matter of perspective, the Ukrainian nationalists would say. But this was a, a group which I would like to, I think is fair to characterize as generic fascism right they did mm -hmm. not call themselves fascist but they did not object to they saw themselves as part of this new order that hitler was building they were not primarily collaborators they would collaborate with the nazis but the aim was to copy that which slovaks slovak nationalists and croat nationalists had done to get a satellite status right as mm -hmm. allied of, of adolf hitler to destroy primarily the russian soviet empire but also go after the Jews and go after the Poles to get an ethnically cleansed greater Ukrainian state. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what do you want to call this fascism? Well, some people do, some people don't. They call it integral nationalism or ustashism mm -hmm. or national liberators. Mm -hmm. I think it's semantics, but I think, you know, mm -hmm. it's easy to just use a term, but it's quite complex to explain this. It takes five minutes just to go through the background, but it's. I think that that's necessary to understand what we're talking about here. Fantastic. That was exactly what i was looking for thank you so much but i still have a question about the the ukrainian nationalists who followed this so lebed in particular um you said earlier that he adopted sort of this pluralistic discourse when he started to work with the united states in the 1940s and 50s i assume he wasn't running around talking about how terrible democracy was when he was in this period did he did he start to embrace democracy at least ostensibly no, he didn't. I mean, okay. uh, if you look at the Ukrainian diaspora historiography, they, they often see this, this claim that Owen, the revisionist Owen in August 1943, embraced democracy and pluralism. Well, they did not. They did not use the term democracy other than in, in a pejorative way up until 1948. They sometimes talk about pluralism, mm -hmm. but they paid lip service to this uh, because okay. they realized that the Americans were not interested in this. And, and there's also a rivalry between the three wings of the UN. You have then the Melnik UN M after the leader Melnik, which were essentially sidelined. But the big group was the Bandera group, right? Mm -hmm. And they remained committed, unrepented totalitarians. They continued uh, well, oper operating in a very Leninist way through 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 closed cells and whatnot. Well, so did Leben. But and they they fought. Uh, with with the labor group about the the support of the MI6 and the OSS later on the CIA, right? And maybe Norm told you about this. They they, they carried out a number of very disastrous airdrops, uh, mm -hmm. uh, parachuting agents into into Western Ukraine. And the Bandrides presented the CIA with false information. They they said, well, you know, we can snap our fingers and we have like thousands of rebels that will stand up and then take up arms fighting for free Ukraine. In reality, this, this armed insurgency was essentially broken by 1948, even though there were pockets here and there. But it's the, the, the UNB, the Bandera wing, they remained open totalitarians. They were also controlling the the, the displaced persons camps uh, through mm. the so-called UNSB, the Slushba Bespek, the UN Security Service. And that's not a story in and by itself, which which 
still has not been researched. Mm. There were CA projects, the, the OSS project Operation Ohio and Operation Bingo, which documents are not classified. And it seems to be the case that in these displaced persons camps, that the, the, the CIA and the OSS were present as the banderites were kidnapping and, and interrogating and right. torturing and sometimes, sometimes killing other Ukrainians because the Soviets had with its number of displaced persons that came to the West, there were a number of Soviet moles and infiltrators and spies and, and the Ukrainians and the Americans were, and the British were very eager to find out who those, those moles and spies were, were because mm -hmm. they had thoroughly penetrated the So they interrogated suspected, suspected uh, moles and there are a number of, uh, of recollections here of, of people that have been tortured and, and they were blindfolded, but they had English speakers present so that, that, that the Slosho Bespeki were torturing them with the presence of English speakers identified as Americans. We simply don't know. The documents are still not, avail are not available, but it seemed to be a situation not entirely dissimilar from what we've seen in some other, in, in, you know, in Iraq or in Afghanistan and whatnot, that local people were contractors carrying out what the CA could not do due to you know, constitutionality and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So they did that. So, so the Slosho Bespeki controlled and kidnapped up to 100,000 people were killed in Western Germany. Between 1945 and 1955, mm. poorly un, un, uh, investigated, but also so they controlled that and they continued to carry out political violence against their political opponents. They were openly authoritarian, and they sold and controlled they controlled the drug and and cigarette and alcohol trade in the camps. And they were very skillful at producing fake U.S. twenty dollar bills, which the Americans were very unhappy about. So they they washed their hands of them. By 1949, and they're unhappy also about the fake information that the, that the band rights gave the CIA. So that was the band right group. The small micro group led by Lebed was much smarter. Right. They uh, paid lip service to democracy. They worked with Americans. They gave them truthful information. Lebed handled over essentially his entire archive with, with, with detailed information on the microgeography and the cells and the insurgency in Western Ukraine, uh, which was very useful in case that um, there would be. A World War Three, as the band rights are hoping for, or others are fearing. If the Red Army would start to move, they would have then information, uh, local agents there. So Lebed paid, well, it didn't pay lip service to democracy, but to pluralism and to Western values, and 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 increasingly started to articulate himself in the terms of being, the, you know, faithful allies of the of the West. Whereas the band rights. The, 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 the Americans washed their hands of them in 1949, then they con mm -hmm. continued collaboration with the British until 53, 54, mm -hmm. until the British were taken for a ride, uh, mm -hmm. and then they started working with Italians, and then the, the newly independent Western German intelligence service, BND from 56 and so on, all leading to disastrous results. And then thereafter, the, the Bandera movement then worked with groups to the far right that the, the Americans did not want to support. They were primarily sponsored by Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist China, <laughs> Francisco Franco's Spain, oh, wow. and, 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 and South Korea and, and, and Ferdinand Marcos' uh, 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 Philippines. What? So they, they set up this group, you know, the ABN, the Anti-Bolshevik Bloc, Bloc of Nations, which was sponsored by Taiwan and South Korea. Uh, so, so the band rights was stationed there. They had the radio broadcasts and whatnot in Taipei, and they were they had their stations also in Franco Spain. When is this? Fifties, fifties, fifties. The 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 own radio station in Taipei was up functional from nineteen fifty five to nineteen fifty nine, and Franco received the uh, uh, status quo Bandera's right hand uh, twice in in Madrid, and and they had their radio broadcast there. And, <laughs> Also trained uh, veterans of the Waffen SS uh, division Galizien, the Ukrainian Waffen yeah. SS, was likely trained there. Also, all this stuff is is is, is not the documents is are still classified, so we can we can see this by inference. But the stuff pertaining mm. to Lebed, that one is available through the mm. Nazi War Crimes and Japanese War Crimes Act, right? The two mm -hmm. releases in 2005, 2007, which uh, uh, Richard Brightman and Norm Goda has done a marvelous job going through this, right? Yes. So. In that sense, right, the paradox here was that Elizabeth Holt, uh, Holtzman, um, uh, member of uh, uh, the House of Representatives, pushed mm -hmm. for this Holt, you know, this Holtzman amendment. There was sort of suspicions of Nazi war criminals making it to the United States after World War II, primarily, you know, people like Vernon von Braun and whatnot, they were suspecting. Mm -hmm. But so they, they, they declassified the treasure trove of documents, but they didn't find too many Nazis, hardly any Nazis at all. But they found a lot of vaults. Croats and not least West Ukrainians. So you have these massive treasure trove documents available at the same time as the cage ex KGB archives in Ukraine and Lithuania are now available. So you can cross reference them, right? So you're able now to reconstruct quite a bit of this history. 
So Lebed, well, what should I say about him? He was, when Bandera was arrested in 1941, he was sent to this Selenbau, this annex to Sachsenhausen, where he lived a relatively comfortable life with mm -hmm. conjugal visits and whatnot, but he was, he was sidelined. Lebed was running the, the UUN uh, as acting leader from mm -hmm. September 41 to, to May of 1943. At the time, they mm -hmm. collaborated with the Nazis and they started launching this ethnic cleansing of the Poles. At that point, the organization was explicitly totalitarian, anti-Semitic and all that stuff. stuff. But after 43, he, he whitewashed that, that past. He would, of course, be barred from entering the United States because he was a convicted murderer. He was sentenced to, 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 to death for the murder of Piratsky, which didn't deny his, his involvement in that, which was later converted to seven consecutive death penalty, uh, life sentences in prison. Right. So he was barred from entering the United States, but he, uh, there was a CIA program, the 100 pe uh, persons program, that would exempt 100 people of particular importance to come to the United States. This one was passed in 1949. And as such, he was a high value asset and he came to the United States. He would otherwise never been allowed to enter the United States or to be naturalized. Mm -hmm. So he never talked about this. And his his own story, if you look at his own records, what he told the CIA, what he told, what, what you find in the Red Cross rec re records, what you find in, 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 in Soviet records, you know, his date of birth, we have like, you know, four or five different dates of birth. He has, I think, about nine or 10 or 11 names. So he gave different stories, what they did. Well, they all did, you know. They didn't tell, well, you know, at this point, I was I was ordering the massacre of Poles and Jews. So, you know, he, he was, he was of course, smarter than that, right? But the American, the CIA knew, they knew very well that uh, mm -hmm. this, this was a problematic individual. But it was also one... <laughs> who had dropped his to open totalitarianism and just covered up his past and 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 worked for U.S. strategic interests. And and actually, I have to say, I mean, even though he has a background as a genocide there, he also promoted a certain degree of pluralism hmm. at a time that when the band rights were just producing very dogmatic narratives about we fought Hitler and Stalin. Well, he produced that too, but he loves some pluralism, right? Okay. So by doing that, he created an, a narration of history in which the Ukrainians were victims of Hitler and Stalin, which they were, but Ukrainians were also overrepresented in, 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 in the Soviet punitive organs. You know, Ukrainians after 1956 were very prominently represented in the Soviet leadership. Brezhnev was Ukrainian. Khrushchev was an ethnic Russian, but he grew up in, in Ukraine, identified very much with Ukrainian history, um, culture. Chernenko was an uh, ethnic Ukrainian born in Siberia. Gorbachev was half Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea that the communists are all Russians and Jews and Poles doesn't really make sense. I mean, the, the Ukrainians were very well represented in the Soviet leadership, including all the first five presidents of Ukraine, you know, right. including Yushchenko, who was right. rehabilitated by their represent Soviet rule as, as foreign occupation and genocide of the Ukrainian people. Well, he was a member of the Communist Party. You know, what does, <laughs> does that make him? If the Soviet rule was a Russian occupation, well, it would make him a quisling, right? If you follow his own logic there. So there's a number of really paradoxical situations here that doesn't hold up for scrutiny. Mm. But of course now, this is, you know, so when when Russia presents Ukraine as a fascist state, well, that's of course hogwash and nonsense. But of course, the, there is this story that, that they have rehabilitative figures like Bandera and Shukhevich, mm -hmm. who was the leader of the Ukrainian insurgent army, who was in charge of his ethnic cleansing, and a number of highly problematic figures whose backgrounds they haven't faced. And in many ways, they've just inherited this diaspora-produced U.S. Canadian-produced narrative. So there's a number of number of, you know, uh, sourdoughs here, a number of, 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 of old wounds. Processing, working your way through. So there's a number of blind spots here. In the absence of this, these wounds have started to fester. And Putin comes and say, look, this country has Bandera and Shukhevich on memorial coins. Um, fascist. Well, they are making it easier for Putin to, to instrumentalize history. Okay. Sorry, you, there was... Um... So they have this undigested past what the, right. that hasn't been subjected to what the Germans call Aufarbeitung or processing, working through. A number of issues that are not touched upon, the Holocaust being one of them, the pogroms in 1941 is another one, the ethnic cleansing of the Poles in Volhynia another one. And in the absence of this Aufarbeitung, these, 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 these 
blind spots have turned into, you know, old wounds that have started to fester and turn into problems uh, that have, uh, of course, made Putin's life right. easier. You can right. point here that it's a state here. Look here, you have commemorative coins <clears throat> and stamps with Bandera, right? Why do you do that? This guy was authoritarian, totalitarian, anti-Semitic. Why do you honor these people by, by inference that the state is fascist, which is, of course, not true. But I think this, this, this highlights how important it is to address and, and not stop working on history and, and dealing with the difficult episodes of the past, even though I guess right now the situation is such that it's almost impossible to, to start in dealing with Ukrainian involvement in the Holocaust or in ethnic cleansing. This is almost impossible. On the other hand, uh, there was never a time to do this. You know, in the 1990s, when Ukraine was in, in free fall fina financially, uh, the archives were still closed, there was no time to do this. Then came Kuchma, the sort of authoritarian second president who discredited himself by ordering contract murders and journalists and then it was important to get him out then you get the orange revolution and yushchenko mm -hmm. and democratic transformation then you know it's time to support yushchenko in the democratic ukraine let's not talk about this then came yanukovych a backlash an authoritarian backlash well then we certainly cannot talk about this then came this revolution in 2014 the euromaidan and the russian invasion it was never time to talk about this mm -hmm. but you know what it was always time to produce a new postage stamp, uh, mm. rename the street, or print a new textbook with revisionist literature. So, so it's not a very thankful topic to deal with because it doesn't make you any friends. But you know, this this is something that any responsible, independent, westernizing, democratizing state will have to deal with, and it's a path which is difficult. Lithuania are a few way, a few years ahead on this path. Poland even further ahead, with a number of backlashes and setbacks. But it's something that you can't, you know, just undo you know or, or, or wish away this mm -hmm. will not go away and and these bandera monuments in lviv and tarnopol and wherever you have them they will keep complicating relations in particular with ukraine's well-wishers and friends like poland mm -hmm. israel the european union so there is this unfortunate reluctance to deal with what has to be dealt with Exactly. Even though I realize it's the wrong time right now to do this. Exactly. No, amen to what you just said about that. Um, and I have to say, you're just you're demonstrating a fair amount of courage in doing this work because, as you said, it's it's uh, thankless, and I'm sure a lot of people will not like it when you publish this. Um, and in fact, I would imagine people who are close to you politically, in fact, will not like it. And I'd ac actually like to talk about that later um, about your own feelings about this. But so, so as I understand it what is happening from the 1950s through the 1980s um, is the establishment of a new narrative of the history of Ukraine, which whitewashes the Holocaust, the ethnic cleansing, the mass murder of Poles and Jews, um, and also, but I think maybe even more importantly, at least for me, um, is the introduction of a new thing, which is Ukrainian nationalism, this new ideology. I would imagine that that nationalism in their ideology was a new was a new creation too. I would there was Ukrainian nationalism preceding this of a form, but not like this. This is a particular thing, um, and so this is from these Ukrainian emigre groups uh, producing literature, um, media, right, newspapers and pamphlets and radio programs. And this is, you're talking about both the Banderites who were not working with the United States and the Lebed group, which was very much employed by the CIA in the United States. Is that right? Both both those groups are producing this, this new narrative? Yes, I think that's fair to say. Uh, yeah. uh, the Banderites were, you know, as an authoritarian, totalitarian group, or yeah. I don't know if it's, what, what, what's the correct term, uh, they didn't call themselves totalitarian anymore after World 1945, but they were, in effect, authoritarian and with some totalitarian impulses. They were not, in, you know, there's a paradox. They were resentful of academic history. They did not support Ukrainian studies. They did not support academic research. They were very much policing, going after historians, saying stuff they don't didn't want to hear. Leibniz group was more open to certain pluralism and and... There's a paradox here. The number of the, uh, figures that worked within Lebed's Air Dynamics, later in QR Plum PD, PD uh, Dynamics project, 
later on continued into academia. There's a number of figures still active in academia oh. that, that had one leg in this group and then worked, you know, when, in, within academia and straddled oh. these two groups. Oh. They, as a rule, many of them had grown up in the band right community, broken with them, and then joined the labor group. And then uh, after George Bush Sr. pulled the plug on, on the funding for this in 1991, mm -hmm. went in a number of directions. But a number of them are in academia, and there they maintain this sort of like the same sort of like, you know, I would say a polit um, a, a, a apology of uh, uh, apologetics of, of, uh, of, the interwar, uh, of the Cold War period. So they have colored the the uh, the, um, the the narration of of, of the past, and uh, and I think that's sort of like the uh, what what's what's important here. And uh, in many ways, Ukrainian studies, as we know it in the West, I mean, it, it's I have to say, I mean, it's a subjective notion. It's been rather dysfunctional. Uh, it has been very reluctant to deal with these topics. There has been yeah. very little interest in the Holocaust, but a very strong focus on what they call the Holodomor. Uh, hollow, uh, hollow the more is a term they used to call it the Ukrainian genocide up until 1984 in the connection mm -hmm. with the Demyanyuk procedure and the establishment of OSI, the Office of Special mm -hmm. Investigation and whatnot. The Holocaust miniseries that uh, in which that, that brought for the first time the Holocaust into the living room with NBC in, into into uh, in, into American and Western German and Canadian and Swedish living rooms, right? The Holocaust miniseries 1978 mm -hmm. made this a part of social culture. And there, of course, Ukrainians and Lithuanians figure in a less than flattering way, and it stung the diaspora. And therefore, you know, the Holocaust was a very problematic issue that they, they had to, they couldn't just avoid it because it was so central now in history. Mm -hmm. So they start to talk about Hallo de Mor, the, the, the famine of 1932-33, which they called Hollow, but they, as a regular, as a rule, attached the number 7 million to it, which was symbolically very important. Uh, this was, of course, the history of, of this is, 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 is not in doubt. The Soviet Union recognized it in 1987, and this was Stalin's greatest crime against his own people. And it was uh, uh, between 2.6 and 3.9 million people died in the Ukrainian SSR alone. So no doubt about this. But the discursive... Uh, 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 Mm -hmm. direction there is to talk about ukrainians as victims of crimes committed by others by nazis by communists by poles but the great reluctance to deal with the issue of ukrainian anti-semitism the progress of 1919 and the progress of 1941 comes up that that is a the rawest of nerves in that community so there's a number of you know preference to work on the Cossacks uh, of the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, on 1918, the Ukrainian People's Republic, on Perestroika, on Chernobyl, mm -hmm. but very strong reluctance to deal with um, episodes of Ukrainians, not only victims, but also as, of agents of, of, of atrocities. So, But I guess that's sort of like how, how most nationalists um, mm -hmm. reason and think. So the Ukrainian nationalists are not unique. I mean, mm -hmm. you, well, so it's a story about as old as the Bible, right? The the, the mm -hmm. history of the, the 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 walk in the desert, the the, the suffering, the resistance, the redemption. Uh, this is not only the Ukrainian community. You have the similar narration in the Croat community, in the Serbian community, in the Romanian community, and whatnot. And it's a certain like culture in emigrant communities too, which can be referred to as frozen immigrant culture. You know, you, you those groups they they preserved image of Ukraine the way it was when they left in the 1940s. So these are not all Ukrainians. These are primarily the groups that came, the so-called displaced persons, so-called third wave that came in the late 1940s. The, those that came the fourth wave between 1991 and, say, 2014, are very different, primarily Russian-speaking Ukrainians, not as political. And, of course, now the refugees coming are coming from eastern Ukraine. So this is a community which is not, mm. you shouldn't call it just Ukrainian, but it's primarily a very heavily Galician, western Ukrainians, right? They have, they have they're almost like their own people in mm. their own right. They were they never experienced Stalin's collectivization and famine in the 1930s. They were part of interwar Poland. And before that, they were part of, you know, the Habsburg Empire. They did not experience the Tsars. They did not experience Lenin. They did not experience Stalin up, up until 1939. So it's a specific regional culture, which is very strong in diaspora. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not representative. If you go to Kiev or, or, or Odessa or, or Kharkiv, you get a very different memory culture. So this is specifically Lviv, Galitsyn based. Right. Okay. So... So in uh, 40 or 50 years after World War II, you have these Ukrainian emigres, these ultranationalist emigres, um, some of whom are working with U.S. intelligence with the CIA, Lebed in particular, we've been talking about, and his group, 
which was employed by the CIA as part of Operation Aerodynamic. Then in 1957, the CIA um, s established the Prologue Research and Publishing Association, which was the front group for Operation Aerodynamic, which, as I understand it, primarily produced this sort of propaganda. But what they're really doing, and this is what you've been talking about, I think, is producing a new worldview, a new, not just a new narrative of the history of Ukraine, but a new ideology. Um, and right, and then and then disseminating it back into Ukraine. Every year since 1957, there's been massive amounts of radio programs and newspapers and pamphlets being and books being flooded into Ukraine. Um, and so I what I'm dying to know, and I haven't heard yet from either you or Norm, but I'm sure you know this. Uh, I haven't heard what the content of that propaganda was. What exactly were they saying to Ukrainians during this period? Well, as I said, they, they, they were rather pluralist. I mean, they, what they yeah. did was they, they published various distance, religious distance, you know, uh, okay. uh, the oh. Greek Catholic Church, which was banned in, in, in Western Ukraine. They, they they worked for them. They disseminated their information. They published also uh, Leninists, uh, Ivan Zuba, who wrote his book, yeah. uh, Russification or Internationalism. You know, he, mm -hmm. he was sort of accusing the Soviets for violating their own Leninist policies. But there also was a lot of information from this group, this ZPOHVR, this very, very long abbreviation, the, the full representation mm -hmm. of the Ukrainian Supreme Liberation Council. Mm -hmm. And and this was this form of liberal, uh, liberal, quote unquote, nationalism that they were arguing for uh, greater pluralism and, and, and for a nationalist transformation for breakup of the Soviet Union, but they could not be too, too too aggressive about this because the CIA did not support that, right? Oh. Uh, they 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 uh, they were trying to articulate something which was getting increasingly over the 1960s and 70s close to if it's hard to pinpoint them in a political spectrum, but something close to social democratic mm -hmm. position, a democratic, increasingly democratically oriented socialism and 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 it's hard to pinpoint this group because they they worked with they had the far right which they worked with the, the, the mm -hmm. diehard band rights were actually involved on on to some extent the melnikites also but also a healthy group of really far leftist figures like anti-soviet communists like trotskyists and maoists and they organized hunger strikes in favor of in 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 favor of dissidents they were publishing dissident literature and whatnot so the idea here i think the mandate well this was a front organization from the cia they were not to survive one day without the cia but but what it did was essentially promoting the u.s government's view of, of trying to disseminate all sorts of dissents the policy document was to stimulate dissent in the the ukrainian ssr right but not supporting independence right right so any form of, of stuff that was there up unrest in the Ukrainian SSR and will lead to change to, to undermine the pressure of a Khrushchev regime, Andropov regime, was, was supported. So there was a significant pluralism and, and good collections yeah. of, of poetry, historical research and whatnot, but with these blind spots, which were wow. substantial mm. on issues that were very central to, you know, what was really needed for Ukraine's democratic transformation was to deal with these issues. If you want to join the European Union after independence, you know, you have to deal with this. So the, essentially, the Soviets never talked about the Holocaust. It was a taboo mm -hmm. topic in the Soviet Union. They obviously never talked about the Volinian massacres because on the paper, and neither in the polls, because officially it was Kumbaya, right? Mm -hmm. The Poles and Ukrainians were brothers. And we don't talk about this, right? And the Soviet Union also has anti-Semitic touch to them also conducting campaigns against Zionists, you know, which also mm. had an anti-Zionist campaigns so with an anti-Semitic twist to them also. Mm. So so there's <laughs> essentially it was a government and organization to stimulate dissent mm -hmm. by whatever means. Mm -hmm. And it had some democratic aspects to them too, some plural, pluralistic, mm -hmm. progressive as aspect to it too. But what I'm interested in is, is this is this memory culture that was undigested. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you say that they promoted a form of pluralism, and I believe you because of who their boss was. Um, but um, I'll bet you the, their pluralism didn't include Russia, or Russians, or Russian culture, or Russian language, did it? 
well, they had a different program for for Belarusians and for Russians and for Lithuanians. The mandate was yeah. to, to focus on Ukraine. Many of the other programs, I mean, the CIA had similar programs working with very problematic Russian figures from the so-called NTS, the Naradovo through the voice I used, the, the Workers uh, Solidarity Union. Uh, so they worked in the mm -hmm. 50s uh, with, with Russian fascists and they worked with very problematic Belarusian fascists. But these programs were much less successful. They were much more uh, short-lived and whatnot because the resistance there in, in Belarus was very, very limited and in Russia too. But they, have a num they, had, they had progress for most of the, of the, of the Soviet and, 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 and Eastern Bloc states. No, but they did not. So, so, so air dynamics people did not work with Russians and did not want to work with Russians. And there was a certain reluctance also uh, uh, to deal with the Russian language because the idea here, these were Galician immigrants. They, they felt that the, with the broadcast of radio and whatnot, it had to be in the Ukrainian language. But of course, the majority of, of people in the Ukrainian SSR uh, were Russian speakers. Yes. Right. Uh, bilingual, of course, but in, in on a daily basis. I mean, it's, it's confusion here about this, this censuses here mm -hmm. because people told you know if you ask them in 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 Kiev, you know what's your native language, you get very weird sort of results. You know that uh, a majority speak Ukrainian, but of course if you go to Kiev, the default language is Russian. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's changing now, you know. And, right. and in Belarus too, in Minsk, you get like you know the opinion polls in the 1990s say that 40 percent speak Belarusian, but you you don't hear Belarusian spoken in Minsk, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, so the idea for the nationalists was to promote the Ukrainian language, but the CIA of course knew that that they, they did not have the same reach, the penetrative penetrative force that that Russian did. So there were a number of they were rivaling uh, uh, fractions in here. So this sponsored both Russian uh, uh, language propaganda, oh. but mostly outside of the air dynamics program. Okay, but what what was their position on the Russian language in Ukraine? Were they did they favor banning the Russian language, which has oh, no, been no, policy no. recently? Okay, no. What did they, like that. What did no. they think? What did they think? What should be done with the ethnic Russians of the East, according to them? I don't think they had a policy on that at all. No? I mean, okay. like, you know, I, no, I, they, 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 they didn't. Uh, uh, they realized that the Americans, you know, you have to realize, you know, that the Americans did not even support uh, Ukrainian independence. They did not even seek that Ukraine should become independent. They had no opinion about this. They, mm. they used to, in the case of the Baltic states, yes, they did seek Lithuanian independence and whatnot, right? But in the Ukrainian case, the paradox here, they worked with these nationalists who also partially compromised themselves in the eyes of the Banderites, like Labels groups were seen as traitors because mm -hmm. it was well known they worked for the CIA and they were seen as working with a state which was partially hostile. The Americans did not want to support the Banderites and then the Labels group worked with them and they were seen as sellout, sellouts because they worked with the government which did not support the aim, the mm -hmm. all overarching aim that, you know, everything else was secondary to the Banderites, Ukrainian mm -hmm independence right and, and the labor diets well they worked with someone who did not support that and mm -hmm. the band rights could not accept that yeah i guess so, right yeah. so one of the one of the immediate causes of this war this current war as i understand it was the attempt by the ukrainian government to ban the russian language in donbass and i think i'm right about that if if i'm not please correct me but if i am i'm no. curious if that is any lineage with these nationalists we've been talking about no 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 they no? never tried okay. to ban the russian language what they have in ukraine is they have one state language one official state language even right. though ukraine is not only bilingual it's multilingual right so 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 they decided in 1991 that only ukraine is going to be the state, the state language what it did was that they restricted the use of the russian language in in in, in instruction and schooling okay. right. and and that led to unrest also within ukraine because not only russians of course this was aimed against diminishing the power of the influence of the russian language and thereby russian the sphere of influence and then propaganda and tv and radio and whatnot but it also the protests also in the very far uh, west of Ukraine, not least among the Hungarians, because Hungarian language was also uh, uh, reduced in, in schools. There were protests among the Romanians, right? Mm, so mm. Ukraine is, is, is multilingual in that regard. So they never banned the language. It's, it's you, you, like Ukraine is officially monolingually Ukrainian, but in reality, I mean, uh, as you know, uh, Zelensky is a native, you know, right. Russian speaker who speaks right, Ukrainian right. With, 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 and Yushchenko, the, the most Ukrainian right. of them all, with thick Russian accent. Timoshenko, born an ethnic Armenian, learning Ukrainian as an adult, right? The, this, the elite here is Russian speaking. Yeah. So, so the, the idea was sort of a, 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 
what's the right word? I don't think it's the right word. Affirmative action in a way to stimulate <laughs> Ukrainian, right? Yeah. In a way, by stepping out the hegemonic, you know, I- I- imperial Russian language. Yeah. In a way, a return, a paradox is if there is one president here, it's returned to the Soviet p- uh, period of the 1920s when they had this, what the Canadian historian Terry Martin is now at Harvard University, mm-hmm. wrote this fabulous book called Affirmative Action Empire. <laughs> and the Bolsheviks realized that the, the problem here is Russian nationalism, Russian chauvinism, Russian imperialism is the problem. Mm. So they, they, they try to stimulate Ukrainian, Uzbek, uh, Belarusian nationalism, right? They try to figure out what these nationalists wanted, right? The radical Bolsheviks, Zinoviev and whatnot, said, well, nationalists was dangerous mm. destruction. We, need, we should not cater to them. Whereas Lenin and Stalin said, no, no, this is, this is serious. This will mm. not go away. So they tried to ride this tiger, you know, produce local nationalists like tomatoes in a greenhouse, national in form, socialist in content. So they actually tried to stamp out Russia much more aggressively uh, in, in Soviet Ukraine and Soviet Belarus. Mm. People were not happy about this. They they mm. choose they were only moderately successful. Same thing in Belarus, which mm-hmm. I've worked on. So it was this idea here that, you know, Russian imperialism is a problem. We stimulate nationalism as a counterweight. And I think in that regard also, particularly now with, with Russian media, Russia being the dominant language, most of the books were being printed in, in Russian. There were actually more books printed in Ukrainian in the Soviet period than, than today, right? So it's a way of, so they never tried to ban it, but we're trying to, they're moving away from Russia, you know, and the yeah. Russian language is, uh, because Putin comes and say, here, look here, they're ethnic Russians. Well, most people are not ethnic Russians. They're Ukrainian speaking, uh, Russian speaking Ukrainians. It's not like in Estonia, they have, well, we have ethnic Russians here in Narva and Kotlayerv and whatnot. It's rather we have a transitional area here where people are bilingual and somewhere halfway between Moscow and Kiev, you have Russian language, Russian dialects with the Ukrainian influences switching to Ukrainian with Russian dialects, right? It's a transitional period, just like this part of Sweden where I live, you know, the it's transitional dialect into Danish. And where mm-hmm. I come from, Western Sweden, it slowly goes over into Norwegian. Nor- uh, Ukrainian, Russian, Belarusian are effectively uh, comprehensible, mutually comprehensible, right? Mm-hmm. So they're almost like, I shouldn't call them dialects, this is also very, very contentious, but but Ukrainian speakers can understand Russian and Belarusian, right? Without not too much effort, like, yeah. like, like Czechs and Slovaks and Croats and, and Serbians. So it's so they're trying to alter this, right? You know what did they say, Weinberg, right? The, uh, uh, that the dialect is a language with an army. You know they're moving away from Moscow. They want to affirm the Ukrainian sure. language, to break away from Moscow's media influence. And sure. when Russia comes, and say, look, if you speak Russian, you are ethnic Russians. We are defending you. We're giving you a passport, and we are invading your country. So it's, it's connected with that. It's, it's it's much more complex than that. But yeah. there are aspects of this that are quite, I shouldn't call it oppressive, but heavy-handed. Mm-hmm. The methods that have been heavy-handed, they've mm-hmm. led to resentment clearly in the Crimea and also in Donbass. There That's... was a lot of resentment for this Ukrainianizing yeah. policies, right? Right. And still, I should, there should also be said that even before Ukraine, the war started in 2014, there was never a majority, even in Donbass, support for, for, for separatism. About one third supported separatism, about mm-hmm. one third supported a form of federalization of Ukraine and a third status quo. Mm-hmm. So even though this was the case, it was never a support for, for, for separatism. Mm-hmm. Even though Ukraine de facto, you know, over the 25 years of independence delivered, unfortunately, must be said, precious, preciously little in terms of of, 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 of goods and, 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 and standard of living and whatnot. Ukraine was considerably poorer, lower standard of living, lower human development index, and more corrupt than Russia and Belarus. Uh, and those Russian speakers watched Russian TV and knew that their relatives across the border in Rostov, Nadanu, or in Taganrog uh, would get much, you know, twice the salary that Ukrainians did, right? Of course, Ukraine was more corrupt, it was poorer, it was poorly managed, but also freer, more open. And as uh, political scientists uh, uh, Luke and Way at University of Toronto wrote in a book, a very has way with words. He called his book Pluralism by Default. It was poorer, more chaotic, but also more pluralistic and open. Mm-hmm. But of course, with you know, but from Marx's perspective, if if you sit there and, and and you know your salary is one third of what you get in Russia, and 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 the state doesn't work, the healthcare doesn't work, the educational sector is highly corrupt. Of course, there's an attraction of Putin, who de, de facto delivered an improvement to the standard of living, of course, at the price of despotism and all this sort of stuff. And I have no sympathy for this dysfunctionality, unfortunately, the mismanagement in Ukraine as such. This is, of course, not a popular topic to talk about today, but 
that's also a consequence of that, right? That, that Russia had a certain appeal. Putin was a very popular politician up until 2014. In opinion polls, he was quite popular. And, and there was a certain appeal here that it's a reason for that. And it's also partially the, the mismanagement in Ukraine, which right. of course doesn't in no way mean that I endorse the Russian war, which I certainly do not. Okay. Um, let's let's finish by completing the narrative. Um, let's let's go to 2004 and the Orange Revolution and and how uh, what we've been talking about, how it, how did that um, play a role in the Orange Revolution? Well, the Orange Revolution was 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 mightily important because Ukraine mm. really became independent. It never had, unlike Poland or or Latvia or, or Lithuania, sort of like a, a big popular revolt that overthrew or or reforms with popular support. In Ukraine, it went very very smoothly. The the the, the first secretary of the Communist Party, the former secretary of ideology, he when when they carried out the coup in 1991 in Moscow, he actually supported the coup, kept a low profile. Once it failed, he tore up his party ticket that predated his him leaving the Communist Party. Ukraine <laughs> declared independence, but the old Marxist Leninists of yesteryear uh, very smoothly uh, shed skin and became something akin to scientific Mark uh, scientific nationalists. Mm. The first president, Leonid Kravchuk, he was actually a scientific Marxist, Leninist, and an ideologue of the Communist Party. They became blue and yellow patriot, right? <laughs> Kuchma, also nomenclatura figure, right? So huh. the, what happened in 2004 was that you had really a popular uprising protesting a, a fake election, a, a manipulated election. And that brought Yushchenko and Timoshenko and, and Maros of the Socialist Party to power. And with them, this sort of orange coalition of various pro-Western parties. Mm -hmm. The new president of Ukraine, Viktor Yushchenko, who became mm -hmm. president in 2005 to 2010, mm -hmm. he was leader of something known as the uh, Nasha Ukraina, or Ukraine, which was an umbrella organization, right? And in this group, you had the KUN, Congress Ukrainskich Nationalistiv, the Congress of Ukrainian Nationalists, which was the Bandera wing in Ukraine. Mm. They were a small group. Mm -hmm. But they had a number of prominent figures. So when Yushchenko became president in one of the first post-revolutionary Orange Revolution governments, you had here Roman Zvarich uh, uh, from New York and a leading band right from New York becoming Minister of Justice for a short period because it turned out he had lied about having a PhD from Colombia, which he did not, and he had to resign. Particularly as Minister of, of Justice it did not look very nice. But there had a number of, of, of figures. Yeah, well, and, and Yushchenko's wife, uh, Katarina uh, Yushchenko, was, was a member of the band right youth organization, Zoom. Oh. She had a background in, 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 in Chicago in, in, in the band right organization. Oh, wow. So oh. what happened here was that Yushchenko led a democratic, pro-Western, pro-EU, pro-NATO you know, uh, yeah. coalition. But he adopted a memory culture. Uh, and I would say his, his yeah. wife was, was instrumental in that, right? And he started... You right. know, in 2006, declared the hollow the motor was genocide. They legislated this was genocide. And they traveled around in the Western world, tried to get support of the hollow the more genocide of the Ukrainian people line. Most people ignored him. Uh, Canada was an exception with a very large Ukrainian diaspora. They affirmed the genocidal interpretation. Of course, the Baltic Republics, Poland, Romania did so also, and a couple of states in Australia. But the bulk of Western countries, Spain and Britain and whatnot, they ignored this. They did not want to legislate history. It has changed now, of course, with the war in Ukraine, right? Now there's a wave of outpouring of support for Ukraine. And uh, France, a couple of days ago, recognized right. how the modest genocide. Germany, a week ago, Belgium, European Parliament and whatnot, Ireland. Of course, the thing is, like, the, the historiography remains divided. You know, the historiography has not changed, Right. Most non-Ukrainian historians do not think this was genocide, do not embrace the genocide line, but it's now legislated history in a number of countries. So he pushed for the Hall of the Moor. This had a lot of support and, and attraction among Ukrainians, but it also from 2006, 2007 onwards, he established a Ukrainian Institute of National Memory. Oh. And this one was staffed by members of the Bandera organization, various oh. Bandera front organizations. And in 2007, they made Shukhevich, uh, that is the commander of the Ukrainian insurgent army, which was the UUNB uh, armed wing. It's actually the, the main organizer of the Volunian massacres, a national hero in the protests in Poland. In 2010, right before he, he resigned, he, well, he left the office, he made Bandera a state hero, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that also has, has a very sort of like, you know, uh, weird uh, aspect twist to it also because he, he spent most of his time as president 
infighting with Yulia Tymoshenko, his former ally right. in the Orange Coalition, right, who was prime minister, mm -hmm. and he did not want her to succeed because he, he 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 went down badly in the first round of elections. I got I think he got five point three percent to five point eight percent, which is I think historical record for an incumbent president <laughs> anywhere in the world. So he was not in the second round of elections, which was then between Yanukovych, the pro-Russian uh, Party of Regions candidate, right. Right. and Tymoshenko, his pro-Western but uh, Arch enemy, right? <laughs> had to actually had two arch enemies, so he declared Bandera a national hero in order to sink Timoshenko's presidency because she was not in favor of, of Bandera. If she, she was said yes to Bandera's national hero, she would face problems with Poland and her supporters in the West. If she said no, she would lose the vote from Western Ukraine, which was necessary for her to win. But she lost very narrowly. Yanukovych came to power, mm -hmm. right? So this idea here, this idea of introducing a Ukrainian Institute of National Memory model on the Polish case, right? The Polish EPN, Institute of National Memory. I mean, paradoxically, it's a very, very Soviet way of doing this. They have a government agency remembering things. Yeah. In some cases, remembering things that, well, I shouldn't say didn't happen, but remembering things incorrectly. They remembered that, that there were 10 million people killed in the famine of 1932-33, which no historical demographic would subscribe to. They remember that they were rescued Jews during the Holocaust. Yes, there were individual cases, but they also killed <laughs> thousands of Jews, right? right. So, so this idea of having a government agency remember the thing, things for you, That's I right. say right. as a liberal, lowercase l, lowercase d, Democrat, right? I, I'm opposed to this idea that the government sure. should remember stuff for you. The whole idea of memory management sure. is deeply illiberal and very, very Soviet. So, but of course, also this Yushchenko, former communist, Timoshenko, former communists, mm. of course, yesterday's Marxist Leninist, they became blue and yellow patriots, but right. you know, the modus operandi did not change much. Right. And, and that, of course, the idea was to unite Ukraine, at least with Shukhevich and the hollow the more discourse, to unite Ukraine around the national narrative. But in the case of Bandera, paradoxically, he was almost explicit about this. This was a way of splitting Ukraine, to, to sink Timoshenko mm. and to split Ukraine. And of course, this narrative has has polarized Ukraine. There was something that would never buy Bandera and Shokhevich in the east of Ukraine. And Poland would never accept this. So this is this has been polarizing Ukraine. Within Ukraine, it has led to unnecessary conflict with Poland, Israel, the European Union, and Ukraine's friends. And of course, it has been what the same German gefundenes fressen for Putin, right? This is this is a bargain, right? It's a penalty kick, right? Mm -hmm. Look here, post the stamps with Bandera, you know. Mm -hmm. If you want to present Ukraine as a fascist country, you know, you've served it to Putin. Mm -hmm. Um, and Ukraine is not fascist, right? That, that's that's a paradox. Sure. But there, there is this Breitbart, you know, said this, you know, Stephen Bannon, politics is downstreams of, of, of culture. That's so right. In the culture war, uh, this is very, very prominent. It's a, it's a paradox. That's right. But Georgia was kicked out partially out of his, his mismanagement. Partially, he wasn't really dealing with corruption. And his memory politics, you know, did not really serve him, serve him very well. And when after the second revolution against Yanukovych, you know, the 2014 Euromaidan revolution, when Parashenko mm -hmm. came to power, mm -hmm. he then rejuvenated the same process, which is this, this, this institutes which were lying dormant un, un, under Yanukovych. And again, okay. adopting, redesigning Ukrainian uniforms after the UN OPA uniforms, adopting the UN slogans, the salutations in the army. Uh, and whatnot, building a monument to the UN uh, at Babinyar, uh, uh, the, this, this the single mm -hmm. largest Holocaust massacre site in the Soviet Union, I think, in the world, right? Mm -hmm. There was a monument, yes, to, to the murdered Jews, but also to the UN, mm -hmm. which was anti-Semitic and provided some of the shooters at the massacre. So this whole idea was that we share this massacre. That here are 33,000 murdered uh, uh, Jews, but also hundreds of murdered Ukrainian nationalists. So we are sharing, so like we're cashing in on this Holocaust memory, right? So like that. So it's not fascism. It's not far right. The moderate center right mm -hmm. with a twist, which overlaps partially mm -hmm. with the real hard right and pay, plays into their hands. Mm -hmm. But that said, it should be said, yeah, I, I you know, Saboda and the private sector, the right sector, never got the influence that. I was fearing that they would after 2014. And now with the Russian invasion, what's actually remarkable is that the, the far right as a political force is relatively weak in Ukraine. One would expect to be more of this sort of stuff. You've seen this in Croatia and in Poland and whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. you know. So it's, it's a paradox. So, okay. so socially, strong far right, politically weak. Right. I don't know how to make sense of this, but yeah. So let me, let me try this. So you have the Orange Revolution in 2004. And by the way, 
the CIA has been heavily implicated in that. I mean, I'm not denying that it was not popular in some way, but the CIA was absolutely playing a part as were, as were Soros's organizations. Um, and then following the Orange Revolution, kind of the leader, one of the leaders of the revolution, Yushchenko, becomes president in 2005. And according to you, he then introduces this new project of really um, introducing or disseminating this national memory, you're calling it, which is really an ideology, a worldview. And that's that becomes through institutes, through public relations of various kinds. Over many years, they are the Ukrainian government is, is putting out this ideology. And that ideology, Professor Rudling, um, according to you, was largely produced by the Central Intelligence Agency. Not produced by them, but stimulated and supported okay. by them. This was this was developed in the Ukrainian diaspora on their own, with their own dynamics. In Canada, it was supported by official normative multiculturalists, which doled out money to various groups. Amazing. Ukrainians were prime beneficiaries from that. Right. So in Ukraine, through Saturday schools and monuments and textbooks and whatnot. And also the CIA funded projects also did, did that. But but they did not create it, but they stimulated tendencies which were there in this society. But yes, mm -hmm. Canadian multiculturalism, US CIA support for these groups did stimulate this. There's no doubt about this. And of course, the CIA, as the Soros Foundation, as the European Union, the Foreign for, um, Department of, of Poland and whatnot, supported the, the, these, 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 these protests and this transformation in Ukraine. They wanted to see the Kuchma regime, which was discredited, deeply corrupt, uh, mm -hmm. a criminal, in fact, to get, get them out. And it was the same thing with the Yanukovych regime. Of course, the Western world was supporting pro-democracy, pro-NATO, pro-EU protesters. Um, uh, but I, I, I think here there, are, there are larger currents here, but certainly the CA support helped producing this narration with its uh, paradoxically blank spot, blind spots, right? And, and, uh, and uh, the U.S. government is, of course, it's a pluralistic organization with very you know, multi-ethnic community with mm -hmm. Jews, Ukrainians, and whatnot. And of course, there are also various directors within that one. But um, uh, but yes, the support for this has not been helpful in building awareness for the Holocaust, which I think the United States government is also supporting. Right. It's not in the U.S. government's interest of having revisionist Holocaust narratives in any way, right? So. Yep. It's a paradox. Yep. This paradox. Is, yeah, no, it's quite stunning too. Um, so the one thing I was a little bit, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about, um, and I've heard you talk about this a bit, a couple places. Um, so Yanukovych becomes president in 2010, replacing Yushchenko. Yanukovych is much more uh, friendly to Russia and, and less friendly to Europe. And um, of course that brings about the Maidan revolution. But you said that Yanukovych, I think also helped um, promote sort of Banderite ideas, is this right? Or he, get, and he, get, he did something for the Svoboda, Svoboda party, which is the far right Banderite party. He did something in their favor, which is confusing to me. I don't know why he would do that. Why would he favor Svoboda? Well, here we still don't have the full picture. We don't have all the okay. records. We have, we have okay. some documentation here. Okay. What seems to be the case, <laughs> was that 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 Yanukovych was planning to stay in, in power? Of course, he was obviously aiming for that, and and and, and what happened was a number of oligarchs close to him that gave Svoboda, the far right party, this proportionate exposure in the pro government or government supported uh, pro uh, oligarchs close to the Ukrainian government TV stations. So Svoboda get got a lot of attention, um, and and uh, they they almost sailed up as one of the, the main topics in those roundtable discussions, punditry and whatnot. Uh, so it seems to be the case is that has been suggested, but I don't think it's been conclusively proven. But I think it's likely that Yanukovych was, was planning to curl Svoboda to make Svoboda his main opponent in the presidential election, which would have taken place in 2014. Mm -hmm. You have to remember this was shortly after the election. I mean, like in, in France, you had Chirac against Le Pen, and you had again, you know, if, if you have the, the far right as your opponent, you would then, people that would hold the nose and vote for Sarkozy or vote for Jacques Chirac or for Yanukovych. This would be the idea that Svoboda would get, mm -hmm. they would not be able to get more than 25%, so he would, he would be re-elected. Re if he can only in the second round of elections get the more moderate nationalists out and, and as manufacture uh, uh, an, uh, an opponent in the final round of elections. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the, 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 the what what the documents which are available uh, 
indicate that they have systematically funded and stimulated the far right. And after, after Yanukovych was ousted, uh, Saboda got 10.44% of the votes in 2012, the best election they had. Then thereafter, after mm-hmm. Yanukovych was out, they fell down to 49 something. They didn't make it into the 5% hurdle into parliament. They mm-hmm. got a few individual single first past the post writings, two or three mandates and whatnot. But they, they declined. So, mm-hmm. But, but again, here you know, uh, this sounds very conspiratorial. But you know, Ukrainian politics is conspiratorial, <laughs> and, and, and even today, I mean, uh, it's we, we like to think, you know, right wing, left wing. We're so used to think of that way in Sweden, and you know, I think even worse in the U.S. with the polarization today. It was one thing in Ukrainian politics which which makes it stand out. I think by and large, I'm greatly simplifying now. It's the absence of ideology. I think mm-hmm. maybe to make a normative mm-hmm. statement, Ukraine would even do good with some more ideology. For, for the central Ukraine, you don't have, not, you know, Timoshenko does not really have an ideology, did not have an ideology. Poroshenko also, he, I believe, was a member of the Communist Party. Then he was in Yanukovych's party. Then he was in mm-hmm. Timoshenko's party. He had his hand in every cookie yard there, there was. These are oligarchical groups that that that, that change skin again and again. And Poroshenko, Timoshenko, Yushenko, yeah, there's some sort of like anti- Russian, pro-Ukrainian, uh, vague idea, but they really are very, very flexible. So, other than the far left, uh, other than the, the far uh, uh, west of the country, where in Galicia, where Swaboda is relatively strong, and the far east, where the mm-hmm. communists and the party region are very strong, they are more ideological. The central parts of Ukraine are very uh, a ideological. That is Poltava or Dnipropetrovsk and whatnot. They're very much moderate candidates, which do not have much of an ideological agenda. So like the here was sort of like, I think, if you have, this is right, Yanukovych tried to stimulate the far right. They, they, would, they would do well in Volhynia and Galicia in the far west. Mm-hmm. And then he, he would carry the election. But again, we need to see all the documents. The archives are only partially open here. How, how powerful is Foboda? How large are they? How many votes are they getting? Well, they're smaller now. They got did get ten point forty four percent in in of, of the popular vote in two thousand twelve in the Rada elections. They just below five percent. Uh, and Ukraine is a weird. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, say uh, that again. Mixed electoral system. I'm sorry, you cut out just a second. You... Okay, uh, Svoboda in the elections to the Verkhovna Rada in two thousand twelve mm-hmm. got ten point forty four percent. In the parliamentary elections in 2019, Svoboda got, if I'm not mistaken, 4.9 something. Okay. You have a 5% hurdle, but the Ukrainian electoral system is a mixed one with some elected first past the post, other through PR. So you got a few individual mandates. And then since then, they're down further. But many of these far right figures went into other groups, into 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 the radical party, into Poroshenko's group. So they have they have a group of of radical nationalists in parliament. Probably there are five, six, seven percent of them that that could qualify in this sort of like you know not band right tradition, but but quite quite militant nationalists. Uh, so it's less than than I would say in in Hungary, uh, less than in Poland, uh, and less than in many other countries in the region. So Sabota is not very very strong, uh, uh, I would say. But they are locally, regionally strong. In right. Lviv, they got they got forty percent of the vote. Forty wow. percent of the vote, and it's not like a, a right wing party like uh, I don't know, like the Sweden Democrats here or or or, or, or the, uh, the AfD. Well, they're more hardcore with. Mm. Uh, well, they're also broad church. They have those really almost neo-fascist wing, but they also have those that are more, more moderate. But they are, mm. they are, they're, they're, they're quite radical, and, and they yeah. cooperated with with people, really on further to the right uh, with some neo-fascist groups and whatnot. But they are they are going down. They are weaker. Uh, yeah. But the cultural influence, and and of course the UUN, the Congress yeah. of Ukrainian Nationalists, are, are marginal. But he staffed the Ukrainian Institute of National Memory for, oh. for almost a decade. So Vyatrovich, Volodymyr Vyatrovich, who runs oh. the Ukrainian Institute of National Memory, he and his friends ran this 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 memory agency. So the memory agency under Poroshenko was led by a front organization of the Bandera wing of the UUN. Oh. They have a center based in Lviv known as the Center for the Study of the Liberation Movement, Center Daslitschen Visvolno Horucho. And that group essentially took over the Ukrainian Institute of National Memory with filials and wings across the country and with significant budget and significant connection to the universities and whatnot. And the dean, the dean at the leading, the, the most prestigious history department in Ukraine at the Taras Shevchenko University is also affiliated with his far right circles and also in the Ukrainian Institute of National Memory. 
Okay. The Minister of Education, the Minister of Education said he said he quit. That it was Minister of education after the Maidan revolution, he's also a veteran of the UUN. Oh. So the, 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 the staff, the, the, the Minister of Education, uh, uh, the History Department, the leading university, and the, the, the Ministry of Memory, right? The, 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 the Ukraine Institute of Memory. So they they were, and the they want to set up one central archive for the liberation movement, you know, under the control of the Ukrainian Institute of National Memory, led by a band right. So the, the, this didn't seem to be working out now, but there was this. So in that sense, they, this this party got is, is marginal, but they dominate certain features, and it shaped memory. And the generation of Ukrainian kids have now gone to school with this discourse, uh, uh, with these textbooks. So in, in terms of opinion polls, I mean, Bandera wasn't very popular. The UN were not very popular around 2010, 2012. About 25% of Ukrainians had, had a positive view of Bandera. There was about, it was about as popular as Stalin. Stalin had about 23% uh, <laughs> approval rating. Wow. Uh, Brezhnev wow. was more popular, right? <laughs> uh, and now it's gone up. So, so in the latest opinion polls, the UN and OPA have an approval rating of almost 80%, oh. right? Wow. So, so, so you have ten years of of of, of, of working with this, this memory, you know, treating the people as sort of like a mass that can be fed these these narratives, and of course the Russian aggression, the Russian invasion, of course, also mm -hmm. sure. does not uh, st stimulate critical engagement with with, with bad right uh, atrocities, yeah. right? So, so yeah, so eight percent approval of the UN and UPA, approval of Bandera, approval of the Hollow the More narrative, which becomes yeah. hegemonic. At the same time, Ukraine is becoming democratic, open, pro-Western, pluralistic, mm -hmm. and, and incomparably more open to, to Russia and Belarus, which have gone in the opposite direction. Hmm. So, but the official ideology of the Ukrainian government, of the state of Ukraine, was created by ultranationalist uh, banderites with the assistance of the CIA. Am I right? And also moder moderate nationalists, uh, okay, but sure. it's, it's not. I should say also, in all fairness, that is true. But it also, what both Yushchenko and Poroshenko tried did to do also was to also capitalize on a neo-Soviet version. They tried to keep for themselves, retain mm -hmm. that of the Soviet sure. Union that they liked. They presented Soviet communism essentially as something Russian. The mm -hmm. communists were Russians. Uh, uh, even though Ukrainians were very well represented in the leadership. So communism was, was a foreign occupation. They came here and, and the, the raison d'etre of, of Soviet communists was to exterminate the Ukrainian nation, right? Uh, and so its rule was an occupation. At the same time, they produced big posters with this famous picture of, of a Soviet soldier putting the, the flag on the Reichstag, right? Mm -hmm. So, yep, right. uh, you know, and they pointed out he was Ukrainian, right? <laughs> and they were like, right? So they want that right. part. They are eagerly emphasizing how this Red Army soldiers raped women and how they were not heroes, but they also want part of this great victory of, sure. over Soviet uh, sure. over Nazism. Uh, they present so it's the sort of military forces as occupants, but they also want, want to claim certain, like you know, the, the nice part of this. They, they want yeah. to cash <laughs> in on being first in space. You know, Gagarin, the first in space, Anton of the airplane constructor, even though it's a Russian name, well, he was one of us because he lived in yeah. Ukraine, right? So some people, some communists that they like become part of the canon, but mm -hmm. as a general rule, communism is something Russian, something genocidal, aiming to kill us, and therefore our hollow, larger than the hollow of the Jews, was essentially uh, compared to, to, you know, to Hitler. Right. Hitler and Stalin, one killed the Jews, one killed the Ukrainians, the two genocides, our was larger. That's sort of very simplistic narrative. Yeah. Uh, paradoxically also allows a certain sort of like nostalgia for and, and veneration of the positive contribution yep. of Ukrainians having defeated Hitler. Yep. Have, with you des describing it, it actually does make a certain sense. I mean, it's it's a convenient memory, right? Um, well, uh, you have officially blown my mind, Professor, and this is really remarkable work you've done. And I, I as I understand it, am I right that you have not published this yet? Well, I've published a number of articles, but I'm doing now a larger biography of of, of Lebed, uh, uh, oh. which, which will probably appear in, in two volumes, one from up till 1944-45 and one oh. for, for the CIA period. Oh. So I have a very large manuscript of over 1,000 pages that I will try oh. to cook down, boil down to something presentable. But I have a number of articles on this. Oh, you do? But I have, it's a detailed biography, political biography of Lebed from his birth in 1909 through his, you know, roles of terrorists, uh, genocide there, then suddenly 
the West's most faithful ally and promoter of, of progressive narratives of, uh, yeah. And how he died in, in peaceful in his bed in, in Pittsburgh in 1998. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, so, so Bandera died, he was killed by a poison gun in, 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 uh, in uh, Munich. Munich, yeah. Stets, Stets, uh, Shukhevich, uh, probably committed suicide after he fought the Soviets, killed himself in 1950. Leben lived out a very, a very sort of like not obscure life, but a, mm -hmm. a very successful long mm -hmm. life, almost at the age of 90, and uh, was able to color and define and shape much of contemporary memory in Ukraine. And unlike Bandera, Shukhevich, and Stetsko, and these people uh, that led the UN, he is sort of like, you know, not as much uh, focused upon. And yet, I think he's much more interesting, much more intelligent. Mm -hmm. Than Bandera, mm -hmm. who failed with everything he did essentially, he split the wound not once but twice, and, mm -hmm. and died being killed, assassinated by the KGB. Lebed worked behind the curtains, and uh, we see his legacy much more so than Bandera's today. Amazing, and yet, Am yeah, yes, behind the curtains. Amazing, amazing. So, when do you think the book will be published? Terrible question, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, you know, I moved from Singapore to Sweden, and then there was a war in Ukraine, and, and yes. a lot of my work was just supporting Ukrainian refugees and helping academics and, you know, this place and whatnot. I hope in, in, in the next two years, the manuscript is, is essentially done. I asked okay. somebody cut out some of the Swedish systems and, and, and publish and publish language and chop it up in, in, into sections to make it presentable. And in the meantime, you said you have some articles published on it? Well, I have a number of articles. On number? I have an article. Actually, mentioned Norman Goda. Uh, uh, he, yeah. he did a, a book on uh, uh, Holocaust memory. I have, yeah. I have a long chapter on Lib there. And I have a, 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 a book the uh, University of Pittsburgh called Papers. It's there, a, a volume called The Un, the Upa, and the Holocaust, uh, a study in the manufacturing of historical myths. But that one appeared in 2011. So that's already a little bit dated. So yeah. I, I have three kids. I moved to you know, Asia and Europe and whatnot, you know, sure. so, oh. that war really you know, curveball. But I hope to have it, have it as soon as possible, maybe two years, one year. Yeah, it's well, done, I, essentially. I've been working on a book for more than a decade, so I understand <laughs> entirely. Um, I, I just want to say, Professor Rudling, this has been an amazing presentation, and I think you're doing remarkable work. And I am so grateful that you came and, and shared it with us. Thank you very much for this. My pleasure. Okay. Have a, a great evening, and um, I hope to be in touch with you sometime. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank for you. a great interview. Very good questions. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Bye. Good night. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To become a patron of the show and have access to bonus episodes, AMAs, and the Unreported News Analysis Show, go to patreon.com slash unregistered. Thanks for listening.